Wen Chiang. I'm going to start with just a, a general question, really, but it's obviously very well and highly regarded amongst Doctor Who fandom. Um, why do you think that is, and why has it been so enduringly popular out of all the stories that have been produced? Is that for all of it? Yeah, yeah, general stuff for everyone, really. Shall I Louise? go? OK. I think because it was a six-parter, because it had more money spent on it than the others, you know, because you look at something like, is it the end of the world? Yeah. Yeah, which didn't have much money spent on it at all. Um, and they, they, so they, they, they hauled in the budget for this one. Uh, also... I think Robert Holmes was the right, was the Moffat of his time. <laughs> I think he really, he really knew how to write a script and he would shamelessly plagiarise. So we've got, you know, Eliza Doolittle going on, we've got Sherlock Holmes going on, we've got, he's, he's really picked his moments to, to um, you know, haul those two stories together. And of course the original intention was that Leela was a, was a pupil, and, and Tom, the doctor, w w was, was the tutor. So he really, he really exploited that in that story. And I just think Victoriana London is always a hit. Whenever you, whenever you visit there, whatever programme visit there, somehow it seems to work. It's a sort of romantic English subliminal memory going on. I don't know, we've got it's grandparents. It's very real. Going, yeah, the fog yeah. always rolls it's in. It's very, very tangible, real. Yeah. Do you think it's something that the BBC excels at, actually? They've got, yeah, they know that era, they've done they're it. They're good at the costume drama, aren't they? They dramas. can do it. Mm. And there um, are no robots. No. Um, gentlemen, when, when, you were, when you were on Doctor Who, did you feel at the time that this has got real quality about it? Or were you disappointed that you didn't get Baker foil monsters and, uh, and high collars? <laughs> No, it was a lovely job to do, and um, as it, ha having six episodes, it expanded slowly and just displayed itself in a funny kind of way. But when I watched it, when it came to the last one of these, um, the only problem was the monster, but, you know, but the rest of it is terrific. But, and the monster is shown just in quick clips, yeah. so you don't actually see it much. Well, I, somebody brought up a photograph, and the monster was there revealed in, in, in all its velvet glory, you know, but we didn't see that. We're talking about the giant rat, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it wouldn't be talons without the giant rat. We're talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> you just got quick flashes of it. It was never dwelt on, really, so it was mysterious. And, uh, and the leisurely way you were drawn into it, I think, was, was, was wonderful, because... I'm, you had all these episodes. And David Maloney had exactly the right touch. Yes, good director. I've yeah. worked with him several times. Very good. Actually, can I just expand on that? Um, how would you describe David's <laughs> style of directing? Kind of laid back. He was, he was Not a, obtrusive, was he? I mean, he was... He was an ex-actor. He would just let you get right. on with it, basically. And that's... Uh, actors will tell you that the most important thing in casting a thing is casting it, really. You get the right faces, the right people, and hopefully we'll interact, and you let them get on with it. A good director tells you what he thinks the show's about, says, do it. And, you, and, and they say, well, we don't, a bit more of that, and maybe a bit less of that. But they don't actually say to you, do it this way. Or at least most <coughs> actors don't like to be told that. Mm -hmm. In that period, there were actors who said, um, this, this director's very strange. He hasn't told me how to play the part. And you think, you're a bloody actor. You bring, <laughs> you bring it with you, you know. It's amazing. But uh, David was very laid back because he was an actor. Very laid back. He was also slightly preoccupied because Blake Seven was just beginning around oh, there. Of course. And he was casting that at oh. the time. So um, my friend Jan Chappell, who was in Blake Seven, uh, I, I remember him coming up to me one lunchtime and going, you know, what's she like? Is she nice to work with? Is she? Because he absolutely adored her right. performances and he just wanted to know if she'd be a team player, which of course she is. Um, so yeah. So he had. He was he was he was juggling around mm. that time. So, but he, uh, as you say, uh, and as Pennant Roberts used to say, if you've cast it properly and it's written well, then you can just sit back and let it happen. Actually, just talking about the casting, gentlemen. I think we're, we're quite aware of the reason your story of your your casting. But two gentlemen here. Um, did you have to audition, or did you get a phone call from David saying, "I think you're well, perfect I don't think for you this"? You usually audition for television. Um, you just go to a meeting usually with the director and the producers and I mean maybe nowadays they do but 
I liked him very much, especially as he cast me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just got a phone call because I'd worked with him before, and uh, I got come and be in Doctor Who. Oh, great! And what did you work on? Uh, um, Fall of Eagles, which is about um, a Victorian piece about um, the leading into the First World War, uh, and the fact that the three, the the, the, the Kaiser, the Tsar, uh, and Queen Victoria, they're all related and things. And um, I was uh, I was a man who was sent to I call Sir Model Mackenzie, who was Compton Mackenzie's great uncle, Faye Compton's <coughs> great uncle, um, and he was a an ear, nose, and throat surgeon, and um, he was sent out to Germany by Queen Victoria to look at the uh, to look at uh, Frederick the Second, who was married to Queen Victoria's daughter, who was the father of the Ka Kaiser Bill, basically, and um, he had got uh, syphilis. Uh, of the th which had gone into his throat, which apparently he, he got when he went to the opening of the Suez Canal. And so I was a specialist in this, and I was sent out from London to, to examine him. But um, it was a terrific series, actually, but it was a historical thing, so it was a limited life. It was you know, going to get thousands of episodes like Doctor Who's had. You know. I, I must say that, um, obviously, in preparation for um, today's interview, I was looking through your CVs, and, and, and David, it, did, it struck me that you've done everything from um, First Among Equals to the Chuckle Brothers. Yes. Um, you've had a very varied career. Well, I learned at an early age to take the first job I was offered. And so I've never become fashionable, so I've never fallen out of fashion. And I just keep rolling on. Actually, just opening out that out, um, all three of you have had very varied and successful um, long-term careers as actors. What do you think the, the trick is to maintaining a, an acting career and avoiding typecasting as well? Louise, would you like to? I've, I've really tried hard not to spend more than two years off the stage. I think the stage keeps you match fit. Uh, and you, you, can always, you can always reduce something, but it's much harder to... to to, to push it out <laughs> to, the, to the back of the theatre. So I really try hard to do some live theatre, and I think there's nothing like a, the energy of a live audience mm. and the, the <coughs> interaction that, that goes on, whether you're talking directly to them or, or whether you're just waiting for the laugh or hearing the pin drop silence. I just think there's something about that group energy that is almost divine. Mm. Uh, it's quite indescribable. Uh, I think there has to be something in your DNA that just goes, if I don't do this, if I'm not creative in some way, shape or form, I'm going to go under. So it's just refusing to give in, really. And it's tougher, excuse me, guys, but it's tough for women because five yes. out of every seven jobs, five of them are for men. And out of those two, this is performance jobs, and those two that are left in that seven jobs, those two that are left, something like 8% of them are for women over 40. Mm -hmm. So we've got to get really proactive if we want to stay, if we want to stay active in this profession and, and just get down to writing, which is what I'm doing. So it's kind of refusing to be let go of, I think, <laughs> rather than what, what are you writing, Louise? Um, I've written for Big Finish, a oh, story wow. for Tom Baker and I, which is gonna, we're recording oh. next week. Is there week. a part for me in it? It's Carl Stein. Oh. <laughs> now she tells me. <laughs> good try, though. Oh, press, that's good. Uh, Louise, could you give us some hints about what to expect, without giving too much away um, about your script for Big Finish? Because Doctor Who is often about going out, 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 into the big grave. I, what I wanted to do is bring it in, 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 in. So it's all set on the TARDIS. I can't. I don't really want to say any more than that. Okay. We've got a wonderful cast. So I'm very excited about the cast. You Next like to reveal any of those? Or? I don't know if I am. Let's say, Louise, can I ask you a question? What? Are you going to be the next doctor? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a little spat on Twitter about um, the doctor being being a woman because um, Tom Spilsbury, you know, wonderful Tom, who who's, who edits the Doctor Who magazine said, you know, if you, if you don't want a, a black doctor, then you're racist. But if you don't want a woman doctor, it doesn't necessarily mean you're sexist. <laughs> well, my hackles just went. <laughs> 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 and can you explain that? <laughs> so we had, this little, we had this little spat about it. I think it'd be great to have a woman. I don't think they'll go there, though. 
What they really need is a black woman with red hair. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with red hair? Nothing, but that's the, that's the, they're the discussions, aren't they? Will it be somebody who's ginger? Will it be somebody oh, who's course. black? Will it be female? So I think you, they, they combine all three, they can tick every box. The ginger doctor, there's controversy <laughs> for you. <laughs> um, I'll go back to uh, David for a moment, uh, David Maloney. Um, there's a quote from Philip, Philip Hinchcliffe, who says that he had the knack for bringing out the best qualities in Tom. How do you think you achieved that, especially back in the day of the, of the television series? That's to me. I think so, yeah. <laughs> I think it's done over a G&T in the pub. <laughs> then, back in the day, I think that, that... I think he really, really just met him on a very casual... Basis. If there was any bone of contention going on, it would be very right. sort of gently discussed in the dinner break or in the after-show drink, something like that. It was never, never confrontation, because you lose. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I've said it endlessly, but I always have to put a coda to this that he, he, I just adore him now. I just adore working with Tom now, and um, I'm so, so grateful to Big Finish for having for having enabled the relationship to heal itself and, and actually be very productive. Absolutely. <coughs> um, gentlemen, how did you both find uh, Tom Baker to work with? Well... <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, you're amongst friends and we've, we've probably heard it before. <laughs> well, actually, I, the, the job I most enjoyed doing with Tom was The Trials of Oscar Wilde at Oxford Playhouse oh. in the 70s. And uh, that was great fun. I played the clerk at the courts, and I didn't have very many lines, and I sat sort of in front of the dock where he spent the whole show doing pornographic drawings of him and the boys. The audience couldn't see them. <laughs> <laughs> he could presumably them. Yes, I think yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> I always got on very well with him. And I, he was, when I worked with him in the 70s, he was very much a man's man. And he didn't treat women very nicely then. But um, I believe he's become more of a pussycat in his older age. I can definitely say that I thought you were going to finish that sentence by saying he sat doing the crossword. I, I didn't think it was going to go off in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> that came out me unexpectedly. Yeah. David, what were your um, impressions of, of Tom on Talons? I found him larger than life. I mean, he, he would come in and full of joy of life and wonder, I'd just do a wonderful sh uh, do at a, a student um, uh, union or something the night before. He seemed to go around London to all the student unions. And he was, that was very much his audience. And he used to say, oh, wonderful little joke. And he cut in the students are like that, you see. And it's a little esoteric jokes he was trying to put in. And Dave would say, oh, yeah, OK, all right. Blah, blah. But um, we mostly one just sat and looked at Louise, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Tom famously could be very disparaging of a script he didn't like, but in the case of something like Talons, I assume he was quite um, happy with that script. I don't remember him doing any rewrites or right. throwing it out the window. Or but Talons oh. was quite unusual, wasn't it? Yeah. It was, it was a step away from what they'd been doing. Um, and if he was as forthright with his <coughs> opinion of a negative script, was he equally charitable about a script that he liked but, you know. oh I think yes I think he would hand out <coughs> compliments where he when he thought someone was doing a really really good job on something but he was he was in the back in the day I think he was more interested in oh this reminds me of Fitzgerald's writing on da 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 and then we'd have a because he's incredibly well read incredibly well read uh, and he would he would suggest an author to you if you hadn't if you hadn't read him or her and go, oh, I envy you that you've got all that in store that you haven't, you know, his enthusiasm for literature was, was I, I don't think I've ever met anybody quite so enthusiastic about expanding his mind in that way. Right, but he's very eloquent, wasn't he? Very eloquent. Mm. No, loves a good yarn. Mm. Conrad, talking about um, being very eloquent, um, you can be very <coughs> eloquent in Mandarin, I hear. Is that you <coughs> fluent in Mandarin? Not at the moment. Not at the moment? No, it's 40 years since I did that degree. Um, I mean, if I had to go to China next week, I'd probably be able to brush it up in a few days. And, and what prompted you to, to learn the language? 
Oh, boredom of the alternatives. <laughs> okay. Have you used it ever? Have you put it to only any... in only in very very smart <coughs> restaurants because most of the Chinese in England don't speak Mandarin; they speak Cantonese. Uh, it's the same writing, but it's pronounced completely differently. But every now and then, I've been into a, um, a restaurant where there's been someone who does speak it, and that's quite fun because they're so surprised. You've never used it in a job. You've never used oh, it no. in a. Oh no! No no. You just learnt it for <coughs> fun of it. Mm. Wow. Wow, I'm very impressed. If anybody's got a job for a six foot three English actor who speaks Mandarin. <laughs> <laughs> I have to write one. <laughs> well, David Yip sort of cornered that, didn't he? Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, you've, you've gone beautifully into the territory that uh, I want to go into next about the, uh, the political correctness of casting a, a white actor um, as a Chinese um, villain in, in Talons. Was that ever discussed or an issue at the time or was it just ex well it was it was it I mean it wasn't very long after that <coughs> but Gambon wasn't allowed to play Othello and that's the Othello we, we've lost he would have been a wonderful Othello I mean if a black actor can play Hamlet why can't a white actor play Othello because Othello's specifically written for a black person. But didn't he Very play Othello at, at, at the Birmingham Rep? Yeah, but he was going to do it at the National, yeah. and they cancelled it because yeah, there was yeah. a lot of fuss. <coughs> I was uh, rung up by the Sunday Mail last week to discuss racism in Doctor Who, and specifically oh, yeah. Leela, because right. I had to do an hour and a half uh, makeup, full body makeup, so that I looked I, you know, mixed race or tanned or whatever, they decided I was dark skinned. And I said I would do it on condition I had um, copy approval, because we all know what the Sunday Mail are like. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they'll put words in your mouth or make it appear, even if they haven't got the quotes around them, they make it appear that you've said something that, uh, and anyway, they wouldn't give me copy approval, so I went, you know, thanks, but no thanks. But Is it's. Is that the Mail on Sunday rather than the Sunday Mail? Oh, sorry, the Mail on Sunday, yes. So the Scots among you will know the Sunday Mail is a different thing. Yes, audience. sorry, I didn't mean to deprive yeah, you your no, no. wonderful <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to be racist. <laughs> How do you feel these days about those, those original um, fan cards that were Ugh. produced? <laughs> I think they're shite. I just, <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry, forgive my language. Um, Honest, it's good. I, I, um, <laughs> I just thought, because I wasn't that familiar with working in television then, I'd done a bit, but not much, I thought, well, the makeup person must know what they're doing, the lighting person must know, the photographer must know what they're doing. I think I look awful, but maybe they're, they're going to make it all right. And then it came out. And of course, now I'd go, do you know what? <laughs> Perhaps we should take this off and start again. <laughs> Um, she wasn't very experienced makeup job, right. and uh, and nobody said this is awful, myself included. So I hate them. I hate the original. Um, talking about your your look as Leela, obviously in Talons you, uh, you you got a costume, you got a, a full costume. Um, was that a nice change? One of my favourite moments was when she appears in full regalia with the hair up and the full. And they just that little, they, they just cut away to Tom's reaction and then back again. I just think it's, there could have been more of that, you know, that sort of touching. Oh, when he sees me in a different light, as it were. Um, I, I loved it, yeah. Yeah, I did love it. I had glandular fever during that, so I was a bit, yeah. I was a bit poorly, so I wasn't quite on the ball. But um, yeah, we all like dressing up. It was my favourite toy as a child, was the dressing up box. There's, um... It's about lovely moments, but there's a, one of my favourite scenes, and it's just a tiny little moment when you're in the back of the handsome cab um, with Lightfoot and he's, he's smoking. And Leela is fascinated, but, and please, okay, please don't be offended. I okay, think you'll understand okay. what I'm saying here. Okay. But the way you're playing it, using every sense and focus and look, you remind me of my dog. <laughs> well, I base Leela Risky on, one there, but... Uh, <laughs> no, I base Leela on, on, you know, she's half based on the little girl that lived upstairs and half based on the dog I had. The, 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 whole, bod the whole body language. What is the cook and costume for all actors must be an important part of developing a character. I think, is it Beryl Reed who, who talks about the shoes? Yeah. And, the and, shoes and Olivier always said his shoes, had to get the shoes. Is that something you found in your careers? Have there been certain props or costume pieces you've gone, 
yes, this this is this is right. This this is giving me the window into this character. No. You, <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew that. One. <laughs> there are things you get to like if it, if you're given to wear, and you kind of quite like them. And the thing that costumes make you stand up straight and and things, which you think, yes, yeah, it's rather nice, but. Um, I, th I just read the script and, and get some kind of impression from that and try and match up the, the acting with what I got the impression from the page from. Um, but there are people who are obsessive about bits of costume and things. Actors are very strange about all sorts of things. They won't <coughs> say lines because they can't say it because they're a person rather than the character they're playing. It's very strange. And so as everyone has their own idiosyncrasies, so Colin famously for many years had his lucky pants yeah. as he would wear. <laughs> too much information. <laughs> <laughs> you probably saw them in I'm a Celebrity, I imagine, at some point. Um, I think there was another hand up from the audience. Yes. Yeah, Louise, at a previous convention, you said you were then doing a stand-up routine. Is that something that's still going on? I did do it, and I, um, I, I got a bit scared, to be honest. And the most difficult thing about stand-up is renewing the material all the time because I'm an actor that's used to working with text and honing it, and so it sounds spontaneous, but actually it's rehearsed within an inch of its life. So um, I, I, I found the writing of the material too complicated, but I did develop my stand-up routine with Helen Goldwyn into a one-woman show, uh, Pulling Faces, um, which is now published, which we're thrilled about. So I've got some copies here if anybody, anybody's interested later. Um, so comedy, I love comedy, but I just think, I just don't think the stand-ups for me, unless I had write, some writers around that I could bat with, as it were. I just don't have that, I'm just not clever enough. But you know, shows like The Now Show, you know all that, do, do any of you listen to that, The Now Show? The material, the wonderful material they come up with week after week, I'm lost in admiration at their, at their skill. You know, they write songs every week, they've got, five or six different routines going. But I think they've got about 12 writers on the team. I think that's the way to do it. So the short answer is no, I'm too chicken. <laughs> <laughs> but you have been performing in a, a play recently that's been very well. Gutted, yeah. Haven't you? yeah. How was that? It was, uh, it was it, you know, the clues in the title, it was called Gutted. So we were emotionally naked every night. Um, I loved doing it because it really did flex the acting muscles and I'm quite glad not to be wailing in the evening now. <laughs> Five weeks was enough for me. Yeah. Has that come to an end now? It, well, at the moment. I think it should go on camera. I think it's a movie script. Right. Um, they're talking about a possible West End transfer, but I, you know the, the subject material is very, very difficult. Incest, paedophilia, abuse. It was also very funny in places. Uh, but it's not an easy, you know, if somebody said to me, do you want to go and see this play? I'd probably have gone, you know what, I think I'll give that one a move. <laughs> I would rather go to some stand-up on a Friday night. Um, but I am so pleased I did it. I found it the most wonderful experience. And Ricky Beadle Blair is writing <laughs> scripts that nobody else dares to write and putting them on in, in um, socially deprived areas. And uh, he'll do anything he can to get the audience. There's even a Twitter feed in the audience, so we're getting a really modern audience in. I, I, I think it was a sensational experience. Brilliant. Well, your enthusiasm obviously is pouring out for that part. <laughs> and it just makes me wonder, um, if today wasn't focused on Doctor Who, from your, your long careers, what parts are you most, most proud of? Um, David, do you have particular roles that you've really enjoyed? <coughs> well, it's always the next one, really. I mean, but the things I've. Uh, it's quite interesting for a year kissing Sarah Miles twice nightly and Bye 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 Regina, that was good. But, um, <laughs> and your one man show? And my one man, oh, I did a one man show about James Boswell because I got to that stage in my career that uh, nobody seemed to be seeing me as a leading man anymore or whatever. Um, and uh, so I wrote this thing for myself and uh, used my middle name so that nobody would think it was just an act of being self-indulgent. <laughs> but uh, it won a fringe first and I went on and did uh, about 85 performances on it. But, um, you know, it's a very lonely thing. We talked about this earlier. It's a, just a desperately lonely thing doing a one-person show because 
you know, actors love the camaraderie of the dressing room and the and rehearsals and things. And this is only you. It's uh, it's quite daunting. We go out on every night and say, my God, is there, is there going to be anybody there for a start? And one night I went on, there was only one person in the audience. And uh, but then you know, that you say, but he happened to be a radio producer. He said, can we have the radio version of it, please? Oh, really? yes. uh, thank you very much. But um, I, I suddenly went on and wrote them for other people because I thought that uh, everybody should have the experience once in their life of actually doing a solo show. Really. And they've all been done professionally. Three for men and three for women. Very, yeah, it's very... Uh, um, um, equal. E <laughs> very equal, e yes. Um, so a little bit, um, but actually I find that there was more disappointment in the writing than I've ever had in, as an actor, because an actor get used to rejection, but some, you're trying to do something new and you're being rejected and people can't, you know, no one give you the money to do it and it's all very difficult and casting it, people say, oh yes, nobody's writing parts for 40 year old women. Here's a part for a 40 year old woman. Oh, I don't know, that's a bit, oh, I don't like to do something on my own, you know, and all that. You know, I've got rejection letters from famous actresses who say, oh, you know, we, we'll set the script because they kept saying, nobody writes parts for women anymore of a certain age. Here's a part. Oh, right. Ah, ah. Mm, oh. Ah, no. Well, um, yes, yes, but uh, um, no. And that's it. it. It must be very hard, having written a, a one-person show, performing in it, to then take direction as well. You must have an absolute sense of ownership. I think you need an outside eye. Just, I mean, otherwise it would be indulgent, you know. <laughs> You need somebody to say, you know, you're over the top there, too much of that or whatever, you know. It's, uh, it would be a terrible ego trip otherwise. But, uh, I thought yeah. need, I need a drink. Louise, so from your career, what would, what would your highlight be, other than Leela, obviously? <laughs> well, I, for television, I would say Blanche in Tenko. Oh, and for theatre, I think I'd probably say Rosalind, which I did in Regent's Park, in, mm. in As You Like It. It was really... I didn't realise how wonderful it was till it was over. And I missed it very, very much indeed. Was that obviously all weathers, but were yeah, you protected all at all? No. Just no. And we weren't might like they are now. <laughs> 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 no, it wasn't quite deck chairs days, but it was. Uh, the first Shakespeare I ever saw was A Midsummer Night's Dream on a Midsummer's Night. I was aged nine, and it was in Regent's Park. And there was a full moon, and it was just, that was it. Yeah, <laughs> that was it. It was just wonderful. Apparently, I said, that was wonderful. It couldn't have been Shakespeare. That's <laughs> 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 yours. Sure. come back. Well, I think really what cooked me on theatre was when I was about eight or nine, my grandmother took me to Stratford to see uh, Macbeth with Olivier. and it just blew my mind. But as a, work, as a working actor, I think one of my very first jobs, I started my acting career professionally with Carol Jenner, who used to run the Unicorn Theatre, the Arts Theatre. And this must have been 1969. And we were doing a Ken Campbell play, the great, much lamented Ken Campbell, which was then called Paraphernalia. I think they had other names as well. And I played an absolutely obnoxious young man called Sporty Cyril. I was 23 at the time. And the wonderful thing about it was, as almost every performance, the young girls at the front of the audience used to throw their ice creams at me. <laughs> <laughs> that, to me, was a good review. <laughs> <laughs> and something to snack on later as well. <laughs> yeah. And on that note, we've run out of time, I'm afraid. Can we please put our hands together for a <laughs>